and welcome to Alumni Days. We are delighted that you are here with us. We are having our faculty forum on the book, What is Jesus Doing? God's Activity in the Life and Work of the Church, which was written in honor of Professor Emeritus of Reformed Theology, Dr. Andrew Purvis. I'd like to introduce our panel this morning. We have Dr. Scott Hagley, the Associate Professor of Mythology, the Reverend Dr. Roger Owens, the Associate Professor of Christian Spirituality and Ministry, the Reverend Dr. Angela Deinhardt Hancock, the Associate Professor of Homiletics and Worship, and the Reverend Dr. Edwin Vandriel, the Director's Bicentennial Professor of Theology. And he will be moderating our session this morning. So I am going to turn it over to you, Edwin. Thanks very much, Carolyn. And um, thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to my colleagues for uh, spending time on this. Um, and um, greetings to Andrew. It's good to, good to see you here. Yep. Um, the first activity of, um, of a day of things around, around Andrew and his ministry among us. And so uh, I hope that you all will uh, engage in those various activities. This morning, I already watched the video uh, that has been posted on the alumni webpage uh, in which Andrew gives his, his testimony of what he has been doing for these last five years. So I encourage you all to, uh, to watch that as well sometime uh, during the day. Um, we will be talking here about the book that um, normally, if, if this had happened a year ago, I would have presented Andrew with a copy, um, but I, um, he received, of course, a copy, and I assume he read it from beginning to end, but uh, I invite you all your, there you go, I was going to hold it up, but he, he was ahead of me. Um, what is Jesus doing? What's activity in the life and work of the church? The good people at IVP Academic who uh, published it, uh, this is Andrew's publisher, they uh, make it available to you all with 40% discount and free shipping if you go to the <laughs> IVP webpage. So <laughs> apologies to those of you who already bought the book, but this is your moment to buy it for your colleagues and your friends and your family and um, the pastor of the church down the street so you can have a good collegial conversation about this. So my job today is to tell you a little bit about the book, uh, why, why this book, um, and to honor Andrew after his, his time with us, and then to call on my three colleagues who all have uh, written for this book, and they will tell you a little bit about uh, the angle that they took in thinking about the theme of the book, what is Jesus doing? Um, and then we hope that we will have some time left for questions or conversation. And so I'm inviting you if you have any questions, if things come up well, um, we are talking to put those questions in the chat uh, function of the, of the Zoom. And then um, I will, um, at the end, I will send those questions to the appropriate uh, people. So why, um, why a book for Andrew? And why this particular book? Well, when Students, when uh, alumni of the seminary, when they invite me to their ordinations, uh, I do not always have time to, uh, to go to those, but I will always send them a coffee mug um, that says <laughs> W-I-G-D. And if they don't get it, we can go to the back. What is Jesus doing? <clears throat> and I send them this coffee mug with a note saying that I, um, I offer this coffee note for their church offices and I invite them to look at this mug daily and to ask this question in their ministry. What is it that Jesus is doing right now in this community that I am serving? Because obviously ministry is, um, is changing. It is, um, we can no longer expect ministry to look like the same uh, as it was, and it will be changing rapidly as people are in ministry because the church is changing, the culture is changing. Um, and that we do not always experience um, in a good way. We, we, we feel somewhat, I think, depressed and, and challenged and maybe anxious about where the church is going and where the culture is going and what that means for ministry. And it's very easy in that context to, uh, to look for books that gives us some handy tips on how to counter all these challenges that come towards us. Um, books that help us to make some, some technical changes 
in our ministry, in our church. But I think when we do that, we also experience that those technical uh, changes that they do not really help that they because the, the changes are too big and the challenges are too, too vast. Here at the seminary, I think we are really aware of that. When we train people for ministry, we know that we train people for ministry, the shape of which we cannot predict. In our uh, own mission and vision statement, we say that we are forming people for ministries familiar and yet to unfold, and communities present and yet to be gathered. As in every Zoom, there is a cat, and there is a cat here present next to me who makes some noise in the background. So we, we when, I, when I talk to students, I often say to them, I do not know how your ministry is going to look like. Uh, I do not know the ministry that I'm training you for. I do not know what shape that will take 10, 20 years from now. But I do know that Jesus Christ will gather himself a church because that's what Jesus does. Jesus forms communities. Jesus draws people to himself. And so that means that at the very heart of ministry is always the question of discernment. What is Jesus doing right now? And what is Jesus doing in this community? How is Jesus forming himself a community right now? And, and what does that mean for the, me as the minister? And what does it mean for us as the people of God on, on how, to, how to discern that and how to get in on that work that Jesus is already doing in our midst? Now, I think that anybody who has taken classes with Andrew over the decades that he has been at the seminary will immediately recognize that as a question that is central, was central to Andrew's teaching and to his own ministry. That whether we look at the at books he wrote about the classical tradition of pastoral care or whether it's uh, his existential books about the, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of ministry, that, that for him the, the, the central issue was always that, that the real minister is Jesus. That Jesus Christ is ministering, and that and that our calling is to to witness to the way that Jesus Christ is present in our midst, and to and to ask ourselves how we can get in on that what Jesus is doing. And so, when Andrew uh, announced his retirement a number of years ago, um, when we as colleagues wondered about how we could honor Andrew, uh, we thought that maybe the best way to Honor Andrew was to um, to promise to him that that kind of teaching and the kind of conversation that that invites that that would continue. And one way in which we express that uh, is by putting this book together, a book that that asks from a, a wide variety of of angles. What does it mean to think about Jesus Christ as the one who is ministering and about ministry as as discerning uh, how we get in into that work of Jesus. So in this book, um, 13 scholars from um, a wide variety of disciplines, um, some of them close personal friends of Andrew's, uh, some of them colleagues, some of them acquaintances, some of them people who actually didn't know Andrew personally, but who were fascinated by the questions that he posed and the work that he had done. They came together and they, they asked this um, they asked this question each from their own particular um, disciplinary uh, angle. So. The book has, first of all, a, a section on theology, um, of course, and, and probably the central question in that question, uh, in that section has to do with the ascended Jesus. As you all know, Andrew always uh, asked our attention to the doctrine of Jesus' ascension, the, the lost doctrine uh, in, in the life of the church, um, but that is the question that is being explored there. And then there is a section on missiology as um, missiologists for the last couple of decades have, have called our attention to the fact that mission is first of all the work of God, the missio Dei. So what does that mean when we think about uh, the work of life or the work of Christ amidst, uh, in our midst? And then there is a section um, from, about, um, from pastoral theology. So questions about how do you do pastoral ministry if this is your view, uh, but also, um, how do we think about things like church administration? Not always the most, the most beloved aspect of the work of a minister. If, if Jesus Christ is the true minister, what does that mean for that kind of work? Or, or how do we think about giving leadership to denominations from this point of view? And then finally, a section on uh, worship and homiletics. 
if Jesus Christ is the minister, what does that mean for how we lead the people of God in, in worship and, and, and how do we preach um, through from looking at this from this angle? So the goal of the book is, as it were, to first of all, to invite um, to invite ministers to look at their own work from through this kaleidoscope of, of different perspectives and see in all the different aspects of your work how Jesus Christ is at work there and how you can recognize and discern Jesus, uh, Jesus' work in that. Um, it invites students and academics into a conversation about this, an interdisciplinary conversation. And finally, the book is, as it were, a promise to Andrew. That's the, that the question that he posed to us and the, and the ministry that he engaged in uh, in our midst that that question continues to animate us and that the conversation that he invited us into continues um, also among the, the faculty um, that he left behind uh, at PTS. So that being said, um, we have, we have three panelists, as Carolyn said, um, Scott Heckley, who um, wrote in the book from the perspective of, of um, mission, um, Roger Owens, who contributed to the section on uh, pastoral, um, pastoral theology, and, and Angela Hancock, who wrote in the section on um, homiletics and liturgy. So I'm going to call on my three colleagues to tell a little bit about how they approach this question from their particular perspective. And so I'll take it in the order in which the book is put together. And the first one I'm going to call on is uh, our professor of missiology, Scott Hagley. Thanks, Edwin. Uh, Dr. Purvis, it's good to see you again. Um, I think uh, my first term here was your last term here. So. Um, it, I was uh, sad to not have overlapped more, but honored to contribute uh, to this book. Um, so I'm going to start by going back to my freshman year in college, actually, to explain uh, what I was writing about in this book. So my freshman year in college, I helped start a Young Life Club at a local high school. And before the Young Life leadership gave me the green light to start hanging out at school uh, lunchrooms and basketball games, what Young Life at the time called contact work, um, I had to sit in on a couple training sessions. And many, many years later, I remember two things about the training sessions. The first, it's a Sindabora kid. And the second, incarnational ministry. As I got started with the work, I quickly became frustrated with uh, the first of these core Young Life values. <laughs> Games and songs and camps and craziness, I decided after a couple months, can attract a big crowd, but not necessarily create Christian community. And so with the other leaders I was working with, it was a group of 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, we created a lot of splash, but we couldn't really get kids to care about the reason we were doing all the fun stuff. Uh, it turns out if people come for entertainment, you can't help but be an entertainer. Uh, but the second value, incarnational ministry, stuck with me much, much longer. And so as I branched out from Young Life and I worked for a while in different churches as a youth minister and then later attended seminary, I began to see incarnational ministry everywhere. It seems like wherever churches or youth ministries were doing something interesting, uh, engaging, relational, they described their philosophy as incarnational. And it was right around this time that I discovered Leslie Newbegin, the Gospel in Our Culture Network, and the Missional Church Literature. And I decided that if Missional Church was anything, it must be about incarnational ministry. But I never could fully go along with that. I had two lingering frustrations in this quest for incarnational ministry. The first was the fact that relationships always seem to be strategic to some other good. So in young life, I would go hang out with the kids where they, where they were, and I would befriend them and listen to them. And I would do this all so that I might get an opportunity to share the gospel with them, or at the very least, to invite them to our weekly program. And then later as a pastor and working with other pastors, um, we would describe incarnational models of ministry um, in, in a similar way as Young Life. We would send congregants into the neighborhood to be part of civic committees or to host neighbors at the barbecue or to invite them to our community. And it was always in the service of some other end, sharing the gospel, inviting them into fellowship, that kind of thing. So the, the, so the, the second problem of incarnation um, was that it was then also used as shorthand 
uh, for imitating some or other aspect of Jesus ministry. So just like Jesus went to the lepers or up to Matthew's tax table or invited or invited himself to Zacchaeus's house, so also we should go into our neighborhoods or out to those who have needs and befriend and build relationships with them. Both elements of incarnational ministry, of course, distort what a term like incarnation actually refers to. The incarnation is not some strategic step of God to woo humanity, but a world altering act a divine grace, an act of love in and of itself. Moreover, the incarnation describes a unique act of the triune God, the kenosis of the son becoming fully human, the eternal word taking on flesh and dwelling among us. And even though this humility is something to which we can aspire, like Paul tells us in the, in the book of Philippians, it is by definition not something we can replicate or mimic. And so our ministry takes place within the world created by the incarnation, it does not create little mini incarnations of Christian ministry. So if there's one thing that I knew about Dr. Purvis before coming to Pittsburgh Seminary, it was that he did not like the term incarnational ministry. For, all, for reasons I've given above, along with his insistence upon the sufficiency of God's action on our behalf in Jesus Christ, Purvis argues in his many books for an approach to ministry that is always and everywhere in response to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Our ministry participate, participates in Christ's ministry. However, there's a however here. Uh, while I appreciate and understand Dr. Purvis's concern, I've never been able to rid myself of these incarnational ministry impulses. That is to say, whatever flawed theological rationale was given Elements of incarnational ministry practice seem to me vital for mission and missional theology. And so at a basic level, incarnational ministry orients the congregation toward neighbors, strangers, and places with curiosity and openness and creativity. Incarnational ministries do not assume to know what shape faithful witness or a vital Christian ministry will take apart from establishing relationships with the ones to whom they are sent. And so, as I say in the essay, incarnation assumes that the public witness of the church is something that the church learns to do by dwelling with and listening to its neighbors. Incarnation encourages the church into God's world empty-handed, learning to dwell within the world that God so loves so that they might learn to enflesh the gospel of Jesus Christ within a particular context. That is, until they join the new community, put on the flesh if we follow the metaphor, they do not fully know what that ministry will look like. This stands in contrast to more participatory um, understandings of mission, which offer clean theological lines, but not always contextual curiosity and openness, which leads me in my essay to pneumatology and trying to build a pneumatological bridge between Purvis's theology and view of ministry as participation in God through Jesus Christ. And the, and the incarnational practices, which form and depend upon partnerships with those to whom God sends the church. So let me just really briefly outline the, the pneumatological argument. In particular, I draw from Michael Velker's work in God the Spirit to narrate the public and multifaceted ministry of the Holy Spirit. For Velker, the Spirit should not be understood simply in the realm of personal experience or sanctification but also in terms of the consequences of the public ministry of Christ. After all, he argues, the ministry of the spirit throughout the scriptures has a kind of public facing dimension. Take for example, the judges whom Velker calls the first charismatics. When the spirit comes upon the judges, the spirit creates a new social reality in and through the judges. In places where people are in fear or in ignorance of God, tolerant of injustice or without mercy, the spirit of God comes upon a judge who is able to inspire courage and disseminate knowledge of God. Velker sees in the stories of the judges some patterns that become much more apparent in and around Jesus. At Jesus' baptism, the spirit rests upon Jesus. In the Nazareth synagogue, Jesus reads from Isaiah to announce that the spirit of God has come upon him. And then we see a change in the social ecology in and around Jesus. Wherever Jesus is present, there is mercy, justice, and knowledge of God. People who have been marginalized and abused are given courage. Those who have been cruelly excluded are offered mercy and justice. 
This, Velker says, is the public ministry of the Spirit in and through Jesus Christ. In the upper room, Jesus promises to give this Holy Spirit to his disciples as paraclete or comforter. Right before Jesus' ascension in the book of Acts, Jesus promises the Pentecost. And Velker sees in these two texts, paraclete and Pentecost, a way to narrate the multifaceted social and ecological dimensions of the Spirit's public ministry in relationship to the mission of God and the witness of the church. As paraclete, the Spirit offers the real presence of Christ to the church. That is, the church in the world is the body of Christ. Christ is with us, and we are in Christ. See, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 28. As Pentecost, the Spirit has been poured out on all flesh, making possible the kind of communion and connection across difference that witnesses the new creation. For the Pentecost, Velker insists, is both a miracle of speaking and of hearing. The power of God that Jesus promises makes possible a connection across cultural difference that neither assimilates nor excludes. Each hears the word of God in his or her mother tongue. Extending this image outward, Velker describes the Pentecostal ministry of the spirit as a force field characterized by love. Of course, he's a German academic and not likely familiar with the Star Wars franchise. So by force field, he's not asking Luke to use the force or talking about a tractor beam. He is rather referencing emergence, the emerging sciences around field theory, the sense that persons participate in and cast emotional and spiritual fields. What we mean sometimes when we talk about energy or social imaginaries. The spirit poured out on all flesh, the paraclete given to the church, is not just about the experience of the spirit on discrete individuals or communities, but rather the cultivation of relational, political, emotional, spiritual fields that make human flourishing and knowledge of God possible. This multidimensional and ecological understanding of the ministry of the spirit, I think, offers a subtle shift away from the I-thou binaries that shape our vision of Christ and the church of debates between incarnational ministry and participation in Christ and offer a better theological rationale for the good practices that often characterize what we call incarnational ministry. We join with and learn from our neighbors as a practice of participation in the mission of God, not because we might be the only Jesus they will ever meet, but because such relationships open us up to the webs of connection and mutuality already being woven by the spirit. We go just because we might learn to speak the word of God in a new tongue, in the name and hope of Christ. Thank you, Scott. As you ponder what Scott said and uh, pose any questions in the, in the chat section, we go to uh, Roger Owens, who teaches uh, spirituality and ministry at the seminary and who contributed to the section on uh, pastoral ministry and pastoral care in the book. So, um, Andrew, great to see you. Uh, how fun to be um, uh, here to celebrate your work. Uh, and when Andrew retired, he uh, left lots of books in his office. And so he offered me as many as I wanted. And I took, you know, one or two. And uh, so not infrequently, when I'm reading a book, I encounter his illegible scroll in the margins uh, of what I'm reading. Sometimes I find a Cokesbury receipt. Uh, once I found a copy, this is a, a theological um, um, artifact of great significance. Uh, once I found a copy of his syllabus for his Thomas Merton course, which was three quarters of a pages, page long. It was a list of books and a short description of a final paper. And in fact, I think that's why he retired. Syllabi were just getting too darn long. Uh, once he realized he needed to have in his syllabus a technology use policy, I suspect that's when he decided it was just time to move on. Uh, in fact, in Lent, I was reading a book which I'd taken from Andrew's office uh, called The Meaning of Jesus in which Marcus Borg and N.T. Wright share their contrasting views uh, of Jesus. You won't be surprised to know that Andrew had a few questions for Borg written in the margins. Uh, for instance, when Borg writes that a person who knows himself to be the son of God with divine powers is not a real human being, Andrew asks, why not? <laughs> when Borg says that Christians find the decisive revelation of God in Jesus, Andrew suggests a different preposition, as. 
God's not in Jesus, but as Jesus. And my favorite, when Borg is reflecting on what it means for God to be in three persons, Andrew has scratched one large word in the margins, modalism. And you thought knowing all those heresies was never useful. So Andrew was always thinking Christologically, and so he might have been surprised to find that I wrote uh, a chapter in What Is Jesus Doing on a 20th Century Quaker Mystic. Quakers. Whom I've read. read. Uh, I'm glad you've read Testament of Devotion. Good. Yes, I mean, yes, I have. Quakers are not much known for their robust Chalcedonian Christologies. Um, but my own life and ministry, uh, in that I have found Thomas Kelly, who I wrote about in this book, a Quaker born in 1893, and who wrote really a, a classic little book called The Testament of Devotion, um, an important guide in prayer and leadership. I found it important for me precisely because of his emphasis on discerning the active living presence of Christ in one's life uh, and in the church and in the world. So before Kelly wrote the little book that would become uh, a classic, he was an ambitious young scholar. Um, he longed to make his mark in the academic world of philosophy, uh, hopefully at a reputable East Coast University. He was kind of trapped in the Midwest. He embodied what Parker Palmer calls functional atheism. I think Eugene Peterson uses the same phrase. The belief that if anything good is going to happen around here, it's up to us to make it happen. And you can see evidence of this in Kelly's early preaching. Uh, for instance, in a sermon on Simon the Cyrene called conscript cross-bearing. Uh, for Kelly at this early stage, the cross was a supreme example of self-sacrifice, which we should follow. Kelly reduces the cross to wisdom for living by pulling it out of a theological horizon in which the cross shows the apex of divine agency on humanity's behalf. Kelly concludes uh, that, um, that sermon with a call uh, and, and says the cross means that, quote, it's up to us now. I think that's a telling phrase. Jesus has done his work on the cross, and now it, it's up to us now. Many influences began to shift uh, Kelly's uh, position. Um, I, I didn't, because this was a book for Andrew Purvis, I didn't mention that one of the key influences was his studying at Harvard with process philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. I thought we would just not mention that. Uh, but none was more important than his failure to achieve a PhD from Harvard University when he was in his 40, this, 40s. This was what was going to finally make him somebody, the, the end of his own striving. And he fell into a deep depression um, and in which he discerned the work of God. It profoundly shifted his sense of God's agency at work in his life. A few months later, he would write to his wife, Last winter, you know I was much shaken by the experience of presence, something that I did not seek, but that sought me. A sense of being laid hold on by a power, a gentle, loving, but awful power. And it makes one know the reality of God at work in the world. I sometimes say that Thomas Kelly moved to spirituality in the passive voice. No longer was he the primary agent in his life, but he was the recipient of God's agency in and through him in Christ. He's moved from a position of imagining it's all up to us to discovering that God through Christ is an active, the active agent in the world, calling us to participate in that agency. Uh, this shift becomes tangible in Kelly's articulation of a Quaker concern. So that's almost a technical term in Quaker spirituality and practice, a concern. A concern names something that God is calling a person or community to, a way we are drawn in a particular way into God's own cruciform work in the world. He expresses this in my favorite line of all of his writings in that book, A Testament of Devotion. Kelly writes that God, quote, powerfully speaks within you and me and disquiets us with the world's needs. By inner persuasions, he draws us to a few very definite tasks, our tasks. God's burdened heart, particularizing his burdens in us. God's burdened heart, particularizing his burdens in us. 
In, in describing what happened in discerning a concern, Kelly has brought together the three themes of his new emphasis on divine action into one practical synthesis. synthesis. God's agency, that quote says, God disquiets, God draws. Uh, Kelly has discovered God the initiator, God's agency. Uh, the Christological center, which is alluded to really, the language of God's burdened heart uh, is an allusion to his earlier discussion of Christ's burden bearing on the cross and our participation in that. God particularizes his burdens in us. Uh, Kelly's concept of a concern, which I find important for pastors and congregations today who are pulled and drawn feverishly in many different directions, thinking that it's up to our initiative and ingenuity and industry alone to make things turn out right. I think this notion of a concern can be summarized in three adjectives, cruciform, concrete, and missional. For Ke Kelly, a concern shows the particular way Christians can take up their cross and follow. In that sermon I mentioned earlier, uh, his early sermon, something so minor as having a vacation canceled was an example of cross bearing. And that way we've all been bearing the cross in the last year because how many of our vacations have been canceled. But in this mature articulation, we bear the cross by allowing God to make our own God's burdened heart for the world. We're participating in God's concern. A concern is also concrete. Through it, God's initiating agency continues to take flesh. A concern is not an abstraction. God's concern takes on real flesh and blood when we open ourselves to God's call to act. And finally, a concern is missional in the sense that bending one's effort toward a concern indicates a real participation in Christ's own gracious agency in the world. So I'll conclude with the way that Kelly uh, concludes his own account of a concern, which pulls these themes together. He writes, social concern is the dynamic life of God at work in the world made special and emphatic and unique, particularized in each individual or group, sensitized and tender in the leading strings of love. A concern is God initiated, often surprising, always holy, for the life of God is breaking through to the world. So just as Andrew has helped hundreds, even thousands of pastors realize it's not up to us to make ministry happen to make their churches finally turn out right, to get it right. So Kelly gives us a picture of moving from it's up to us now to a specific way of discerning and participating in what the living Christ is doing in us and in the world. Yo, Roger. Could I just uh, make a remark to Roger? Uh, a long time ago, Roger, um, I, when I was doing adult Sunday school classes around, um, I used to have a four-week course in which I had, took four small books and tried to introduce the authors of these books to the congregation. Uh, Simone Weil, Waiting for God, Bonhoeffer's Life Together, and one was Kelly's A Testament of Devotion, and I've forgotten what the fourth was so long ago, but... Um, it, it was always an interesting series to en encourage the folks to read these small books. I'm delighted to hear that. That's yeah. great. So finally, we go to uh, Angela Hancock, who teaches worship and homiletics at the seminary and who contributed in the book to the section on the very same topics. So Angela. Andrew, it's an honor to, to be here and to have been a contributor to this. Thank you. And it led me more deeply into some of your work. And so I, I continue to be um, in awe of what God has done in your life and I know continues to do. And unlike Roger, I took more than one or two books from your, um, your generous uh, trove. <laughs> So um, maybe a good way for me to start is just by asking how many of you 
have or do regularly preach sermons. Just show me with a, with a wave, those of you who are on screen. How many of you regularly listen to sermons? Okay. So as the preacher or as the hearer, <clears throat> I wonder if you have experienced what I might describe as a dry spell. A time when, um, you know, maybe short, maybe more extended when whatever the expectation might be of what it means for the word to be preached and heard, for the gospel to erupt in a community and for people to respond, um, I'm guessing based on some of the nodding that I've seen that we've all experienced that. And I think kind of the, the question um, that I took into this essay and taking the, the question that Edwin put as the title of this book seriously is, what does Jesus have to do with that? What does Jesus Christ have to do with both of those kinds of situations where there is, where the word is rightly preached and rightly heard, but also to in the, in the midst of the dry spells. Um, so in thinking through this, it will not come as a surprise to those of you who, who know me that um, my go-to theologian for this is the Swiss theologian Karl Barth. Um, that is because um, there is probably no theologian who has wrestled more with the question of how God is involved with preaching. And he does that in, in multiple kinds of ways and from multiple angles, but it never, it never disappears from his sight. The, his own experience as a preacher wondering, how is it even possible for a human being to do this? This was an animating question for Bart um, throughout his life. Now, Bart is very famous in his doctrine of revelation for, in, for saying that only God can reveal God. So for us to know anything about God at all is a miracle. It involves divine intervention every time for that to happen. For God to speak and, and for us to hear and understand and believe and respond, all of that is God's doing. God is involved with that. And Bart famously describes this as a threefold word of God, God's way of revealing God's self. So Jesus Christ is the word of God. The prophets and apostles are the witnesses to Jesus Christ. And those of us who point to Christ as preachers, it, when we bear witness in all kinds of ways in our lives, we are witnesses to those witnesses, the prophets and apostles who are witnessing to Jesus Christ. So you can see this kind of chain that develops here. So notice that in that description though, Jesus Christ is the content of God's speech. Jesus Christ is God's speech, right? Jesus Christ is word of God. You might say Jesus Christ is God's sermon, um, a sermon that the spirit then welcomes inside of the hearer. So even for Bart, the, 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 the human response to the word itself is prompted by the spirit inside of, of a human being. So in that early designation on the threefold world where Jesus Christ is the content of God's speaking. But if I want to get to the question of what is Jesus doing, I need to press further down the road in Bart to where he revisits these same questions in the context of the doctrine of reconciliation. And there we see him begin to talk about Jesus Christ differently, adding, not, not necessarily changing, but, but making a more, making a richer sort of description of, of how God is involved in this. So here he begins to talk about the resurrected Christ as not just the content of God's proclamation, but a proclaimer in his own right. Jesus Christ himself is a prophet, a preacher, a witness. 
He is active right now, preaching, prophesying, bearing witness uh, in the world. Bart argued that Jesus Christ is the inheritor of the prophetic tradition that we meet in the Old Testament, not only the inheritor of it, but the transcender of it, the, the, the first occupant of that category, and that Jesus Christ is not just a prophet of God, but the prophet of God. So Bart uses two images to, to describe, um, at least two, to describe what this is like. And, and both of them, I think, are important for understanding some of the implications of this for thinking about the dry spell. Okay, so bear with me for a minute. The first one is what we might call the bright circle. If you imagine a circle, or maybe a sphere is even better, with Jesus Christ at the center of that, shining brightly, okay? And clustering around the, that center are the people that, that Christ is drawing together. And that the Christian community or the church, we might use that language to describe people who have been actively drawn in closer to that light. But one of the things that Bart wants um, us to know is that the light, this illumination that's coming from Jesus Christ illuminates the entire circle. And that larger sphere is not just the church, but it's all of creaturely life. That Jesus Christ is, Christ is the light of that sphere as well. Everything that is in this sense is in Jesus Christ, in range of the sound of his voice, illuminated by his radiance, whether they're aware of it or not. And so while the church, that gathering that's close to the, gather, drawn close to the center, the church where the Bible is opened and interpreted is a regular place where we can expect Jesus Christ to speak and illuminate and raise up witnesses to his prophecy. Because the light illuminates the whole circle, we should also expect there to be witnesses to the prophecy of Jesus Christ beyond that inner circle. The idea that witnesses can arise anywhere because Jesus is on the move, at work, speaking, preaching, prophesying in this whole circle and not just in the center of it. <clears throat> so in addition to the bright circle, Bart also kind of puts all this in motion by thinking about, um, we might describe it as a road march to describe this prophetic work of Jesus. And here we're, we're thinking about this more as something that's unfolding in time. So that between the, the ascension of Jesus Christ and the end of all things, Jesus Christ is here in the midst of a world where there continues to be resistance and opposition, but that Jesus Christ, the victor, is heading toward the sure victory. That is not in doubt. And yet, God holds open this space and time for Jesus to do this work of prophecy. This history continues um, this, in this time where Jesus is doing prophetic work. And Bart emphasizes that Jesus Christ does not want to do this prophesying alone, that Jesus Christ wants human beings to participate in this activity. So we are not just spectators of the eloquence and radiance of the prophecy of Christ. Um, it's all Jesus. But we're called to cooperate in what Jesus is doing our own speaking and hearing and proclaiming and witnessing signs that accompany and confirm God's self-disclosure in Jesus Christ and in the prophecy of Jesus Christ. So, and this you'll hear is tying back into what others have said. Um, it is not that we are the ones who are responsible. Jesus has ascended, you know, given us this present, the gospel, and now it's our job to spread that around. It hasn't been handed off to us. We're not the ones who need to make people hear. Rather, we're empowered to cooperate in the ministry that Jesus is doing um, in illuminating in, in, this, in this sphere. So we are companions with Jesus Christ 
in our own histories that are taken up into his great history. Even as, and I think this is really important, Bart acknowledges that it is an impossible possibility that Christians are sometimes false witnesses, that we, we, do, we, are, not, we are not like Jesus, a true witness, but that our witness sometimes corresponds, but sometimes impossibly absurdly um, knowing what we know, we sometimes fail um, to, to, to function as true witnesses. So let me take this back to something more concrete again, and then I know Edwin probably you wanna, you wanna um, jump back in. So when I think about this in relation to the practice of preaching and the dry spell, um, I mean, one thing it means, of course, is that I can rule out any conception of what's happening when a preacher preaches and, and others are hearing that Jesus Christ is idle, that Jesus Christ is not, is waiting around for, for the church to, to fix this, for the church to do this. Um, Jesus Christ is not idle, but at work, shining, on the way, um, and that the congregation for the prophecy of Jesus Christ, while it is certainly reliably, regularly the church, it is also beyond that, that I can expect that Jesus Christ is doing this prophetic work elsewhere and having the imagination to, to notice and be attentive to that is important. Third, that Jesus Christ doesn't wanna do this work alone means that it is right and good for preachers and hearers to pray that we will be drawn in and swept up in the current of Jesus Christ in action, that we might be made nimble witnesses to his self-witness, that we might be little lights in relation to his great light, that we might be little parables in relation to his great parable. And that preaching and, and listening is an attempt to serve the prophetic work of Jesus Christ as the eloquent and radiant prophet, um, and that he wants us to do that. Now, here's the controversial part, and, and this takes me back to the dry spell. So if we think about this, about what Jesus Christ is doing now as a history, like all histories, the time of Jesus Christ has ebbs and flows. There will be occasions, maybe seasons, when Jesus Christ chooses to shine brightly, maybe, somewhere other than my backyard, my pew, my pulpit. Um, and that could be because of lapses, our lapses into lightlessness, you know, but it could also just be that this, this has twists and turns. That this is not, uh, and I think about this in relation to even how this is described in the scripture, right? The way in which people sometimes respond to the word and they sometimes don't, even when Jesus Christ is the, Jesus of Nazareth is the one is the one preaching, right? So even on our best days, this is not magic. We cannot guarantee a revelatory word will be spoken and heard. Participation in the radiance of Jesus Christ is not automatic. It means that Jesus Christ has the freedom, and I think this, is, this can sound hard, I think, but Jesus Christ has the freedom to pass over some of our attempts to preach the gospel. And I think about the beginning of the call story of Samuel. Some of you will remember the beginning of that story. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Um, it is apparently God's good pleasure that Jesus Christ strides between the ascension and the end of all things and raises up a, a, a diverse chorus of witnesses and those witnesses have entrances and exits. They have times of undeniable participation, but also times where they remember and observe and seek and pray and anticipate mm. the next time their, their speaking and their hearing is taken up. In spite of our best efforts, and of course we aren't always giving our best efforts, but in spite of our best efforts, sometimes we scatter seeds that don't seem to grow. We can testify to those experience as could all the prophets and apostles that have come before us. Jesus Christ can be trusted to carry his communicative work 
to completion. So part of, I think, affirming the prophecy of Jesus Christ is that we do not despair over the dry spells, but we have a joyful confidence that even at such times, Jesus Christ is preaching somewhere and that his word will not return empty and we can expect to be empowered to reflect that light of life again soon. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Angela. And thanks, thanks to all of you. So we have a, a few minutes left for some conversation. Um, I noticed one question in, in the chat that goes uh, to the heart of some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, so if, if the very heart of, of ministry is Jesus Christ who is at work and our job is to discern that Jesus Christ is at work in this app and flow that Angela was talking about, I mean, how do we how do we evaluate our our discernment? Uh, because we can be off in our discernment, right? And so the, the the questioner asks, particularly when it comes to our mainline Protestant tradition, um, other traditions um, have have way means of to evaluate this. And the question is, says, I mean, Roman Catholics they they have the tradition and the magisterium, or Charismatics have a body of experience against which they can measure that what they what they um, discern. Um, maybe if evangelicals, they will have a direct reading of scripture where they focus on, but, but for us in our traditions, um, how do we evaluate our discernment? So, I mean, in, in a way, this is a question to all of us. I mean, Roger, you spoke directly to, to discernment, but maybe I'll, I'll go to you first, and then if others want to jump, jump in. Um, I think we obviously, our discernment, uh, uh, happens in, in many different ways, but we, we're, we're continuing to read uh, with um, the community and in the scriptures. So I think those are two ways. I, would, I do not trust discernment when it is not accompanied by ongoing uh, living in scripture. And I do not tend to trust discernment when it is not also in some ways subjected to the um, uh, the the community, however you understand that. So um, uh, so it might be that if I'm discerning in my own life and it's a more personal kind of discernment, um, there's still that community, whoever that is, that needs to be with me. It might be my spiritual director and other friends in my community, my church community, and my pastor who have come alongside me. And it's also my and their living in scripture with me. So I don't know that there are foolproof uh, ways to make sure we uh, we get it right, that we avoid that impossible possibility that Bart was talking about, that we might witness um, unfaithfully. Um, but those are at least two things that I think of that seem to be um, what might be guardrails on, on our discernment that keep us from, you know, going off uh, the, the cliff one, on one side or the other. Let me uh, make a comment, if I may. Uh, listening to you, this morning, I realize how much I miss this kind of conversation. Um, I also realize that I've lost some fluidity with the language. I don't use this language much, just sitting in my sunroom reading. Um, and I, I miss the, the back and forth and uh, the engagement. But what I've discovered in my old age is I agree with Roger the, I would just add another component and that is reading the great tradition reading the great saints and theologians pastors of the church um, I've also enjoyed uh, reading biographies of of great saints um, that I find that when I'm, I'm steeped in, in good theology and reading of people who have led the church through the centuries um, provides a framework for discernment for me that uh, I, I would just add to what Roger said. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Roger. Scott or Angela, did you want to join, join Pin on this point? The only thing I would add is I think 
in um, the question, you know, listing these different ways that other traditions might lean into certain elements. I mean, I think for, for ma mainline Christians, I, I would just want to say yes to all of those things, you know, so we lean upon the tradition and we pay attention to experience and we obviously would pay attention to scripture. Um, and sometimes what I use as shorthand in thinking about this is looking at the, the Peter and Cornelius narrative between Acts 10 and 11, you know, so in Acts 10, Peter experiences something. He Acts 11, the church calls him to account for it. You know, we heard you're eating with Gentiles. What's that about? And, you know, Peter's probably well within his rights at that moment to say, look, God talked to me. I did this thing. It happened. Get over it. And instead, Peter tells a story. And the story is an act of leadership. It's also an act of discernment. And it's a theological story. At every move in Acts 10 that maybe Peter's making a choice, in Acts 11, he's talking about the, the work of the Spirit. And he ends the story saying, you know, who is I to stand in the way of God? And then the community collectively discerns together that God has granted to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. And to me, that's a, you know, that's a picture of leadership. It's a picture of, of the kind of ebb and flow and discernment and the kind of messiness of, you know, Peter makes an appeal to the words of Jesus. He's telling a story. He's talking about his experience. He's looking at data in the world. And then the community weighs it together. And it's not exact or precise, but I think you know, this is the way God's invited us to participate in his mission, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is really the key, the key issue, right? Um, if we affirm that Jesus Christ is at work, how do we know? <laughs> how do we test the spirits? Um, and I think, you know, speaking from a sort of a Bardian um, perspective, you know, it's, it's, um, I think what it comes back down to is, does, does whatever this is correspond to the way God is with humanity in Jesus Christ? Does whatever this is, I mean, and, and of course, it's not the Bible would not be involved, but even, you know, that it's not a simplistic proof texting about something. It's about dwelling in this messy narrative and conversation, right, that's, that's witnessing to this this, this central way of God, um, you know, which is, which is coming to make lovely those who are unlovely. It, it, is, it is loving those who are not lovable. And, and asking about the correspondence uh, in that way, I think, yeah, it's part of discernment and that we acknowledge that most of our compelling intuitions you know, can lead us astray. And those of us who study history know this. And of course, it's, it's easy to be blind about this in your own time and place, right? But that this is something you, you do new every morning. You're, you're always, it's never something that we've got this. We're, we're always returning to listen again, to talk with others again, to pray again, maybe above all to pray again. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Angela. Well, I think we are very close to the time that has been given to us. So we should probably um, call it here. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, Carolyn, let me hand it back to you and you can guide us to, uh, to the next activity. Thank you to our panelists, Dr. Van Driel, Dr. Hagley, Dr. Owens, and Dr. Hancock. That was a wonderful start to our morning. Thank you to Dr. Purvis for your influence on so many of our ministries through your teaching. We are delighted you. that you're here joining us today. For all of the alumni, I hope that you will look at your courses and click on the link to join us in worship at 1130. Dr. Purvis will be preaching. And at two o'clock, you'll want to tune in because our president-elect Dr. Asa Lee will be making a presentation to the alumni. And then at 3.30, we'll be back for an alumni panel with Dr. Purvis. So thank you all for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>